So this is Peter Brown from Bio 108. Today I'm talking, going to talk about uh, plant diversity, different kinds of plants, uh, what makes a plant. So we're starting out by looking at a carnivorous plant here. And this little guy is called a pitcher plant. They're found in Southeast Asia. And this caught a little, little lizard. Pitcher plants are flowering plants. Their flowers are separate from these structures. They, they still do photosynthesis, but they tend to be found in uh, bogs and the tropics and places with low nutrients in the soil and so to get extra nutrients they capture and eat mostly bugs but this fellow got a lizard. Uh, carnivorous plants tend to interest people so here's a little three minute time lapse photography video. It starts out with pitcher plants but a lot of it is uh, Venus fly traps but it's pretty cool. Uh, there are 300,000 kinds of plants. Not all plants are flowering plants. We'll spend most of the semester discussing flowering plants. That's what we've discussed to date. But this will introduce you to some other kinds of plants. And then in the next lecture, we'll think about how plants went from uh, simpler plants to more complex uh, plants through evolution. So here are four pictures. Take a look at them and decide which of them you think are plants or not. And then on these slides, I talk about which ones are plants. So it's not a flowering plant. It's called a gymnosperm or naked seed plant, but these are uh, sequoias and sequoias are definitely plants. Okay, here's a simpler kind of plant. It doesn't have any vascular tissue for transporting water. So it has to be in wet environments. And you'd recognize this as a moss. So moss are definitely plants, but they're older evolutionarily and they're simpler than the uh, sequoias that we just saw. And this is colored, it has pigments in it, but it's not a plant at all. It doesn't do photosynthesis. It's a fungi, and fungi are heterotrophs. They don't make their own food. They're other eaters, and they eat decaying matter, the breakdown of wood. Uh, and so uh, fungus can eat a lot of things that we're not able to. So they're really important in our ecosystem, um, but that's definitely not a plant. It's in the kingdom fungi. All right, so this is an algae called Spirogyra. Uh, we're not going to consider algae to be plants for the purpose of this course, but algae are certainly the closest relatives of land plants. And now newer studies are showing genetically how closely algae are related to land plants. And so a lot of scientists are now considering algae to be plants, although they're anatomically and uh, structurally very different than land plants. On the DNA level, they have a lot in common. And so they've created a new group called Archaeplastida, and they throw the land plants and the algae in there together. So how would you define a plant? As you can see from what I just said about algae, it's not always so clear cut. But if we think about plants being land plants, they're the most common organisms besides animals we see in our daily lives. They're large animals, macroscopic. So we don't see the bacteria and microscopic organisms. So other than animals, they're the second most common thing we see in our daily lives. They're large, they're multicellular, they have the same kind of cells that we do. Uh, they stay in one place. So unlike humans that move around and animals that run about and insects that fly, they stay in one place absorbing nutrients. We'll talk about more of the differences between plants and animals as we go along. And one of the things we think about when we think of plants is their ability to make their own food through photosynthesis. But there are many organisms that can photosynthesize that are not considered plants. They're certainly ancestral of plants, but they're not plants. And so we're going to talk about uh, some of those organisms in this lecture as well. All right, so organisms that can do photosynthesis but are not plants are a mini bacteria. Uh, there are many single-celled organisms that have the same kind of cell that we have in plants have called eukaryotic cells and they used to throw them together in a kingdom called protists 
And so now it's still an informal term, although they belong in many different kingdoms. And then algae, again, uh, some people now consider them plants. For the purposes of this, of course, we won't. All right, these are called stromatolites, and they're found in Western Australia in Shark Bay. And these are, uh, sometimes people will say they're living fossils. We have them in the fossil record from three billion years ago, and yet they still exist. And so in these mats, there are photosynthetic bacteria, and they also have a mucus, so particles will stick to the bacteria, and they secrete calcium carbonate, that's limestone. So the particles and the bacteria and the limestone all stick these things together as rock-like structures, and they get their food by uh, the bacteria inside of them. Uh, so here are cyanobacteria. These are like the bacteria in those stromatolites. And so they're some of the earliest organisms that were here on Earth. And guess what? They're still here. So their cell type is a simpler cell type, they're bacteria. But even though we think of bacteria as being single-celled, uh, these bacteria kind of stick together when they divide into these long hair-like structures. Cyan is a blue-green color, so sometimes people call them blue-green bacteria. Besides bacteria, there are single-celled eukaryotes that do photosynthesis. That's the same kind of cell type as plants and animals and fungi have. So this is a single-celled organism, much larger than bacteria. The red dot here is an eye spot. It can sense light, and if you put it on a microscope, it will be attracted towards the light of the microscope. And there are other granular structures in here. You can see one over here. I'm not sure what it is. But in any case, uh, this is a single-celled organism that moves about, and it does photosynthesis and contains chloroplasts. All right, so now we're into multicellular organisms. So algae are multicellular. Here's that freshwater green algae called Spirogyra that we said some people consider plants, but we won't for this course. They're definitely plant ancestors. And then here's a red algae. So here's a marine algae. And again, the newer system considers them plants, but we won't for this course. Red algae is used to wrap seaweed. Uh, so here's just the analysis. So the reason why scientists now are putting uh, red and green algae into the plant kingdom is they say the chloroplasts are genetically the same as uh, land plants. And so if uh, two organisms uh, share a common ancestor that diverged recently, they say they belong together, so they all belong in the same clad or the same group. So genetic studies are showing that's the case. And so uh, perhaps when I teach this course in a year or two, I'll put uh, algae as part of the plant kingdom. Okay, again, it's just uh, before we had DNA and genetics and uh, more molecular understanding of how organisms work, the roots and shoots are anatomically very different in algae and land plants. Uh, algae do fertilization away from their cells in the water. They shoot out the sperm and the eggs whereas land plants retain the uh, embryo, the baby plant. Okay. All right, uh, taxonomy is a branch of biology concerned with classifications. And we put organisms together based on common ancestry. So you're more closely related to your nuclear family. You're less closely related to your first cousins and you're, you're less closely related from them to your second cousins, your third cousins, and so on. And so uh, we'll go more into taxonomy and evolution in the next lecture. Okay, but under the plant kingdom, there are 11 groups or phylum. Sometimes in plants, they're called division. Uh, we're not gonna look at all 11 groups. I think it, you just kind of get lost. Uh, instead, we'll focus on uh, four groups. One of the simpler groups called the bryophytes or the mosses. Then uh, getting more complex, the ferns, terephyta. More complex still is uh, the conifera phyta, trees with needles and cones. And finally, we'll spend most of our time on the anthophyta, plants with flowers and fruit. All right, so let's talk about the mosses. Okay, uh, so this is from uh, the Concepts of Biology textbook, and I have a link to it, and you can read through the whole chapter.
And there's a lot of the chapter that I didn't go over. If there's something in the chapter that I'm, I don't cover, you can kind of skip over it. But um, there are 12,000 species of mosses. Uh, they tend to be in wet environments because they have no vascular tissue. They're non-vascular, so they can't transport water long distances. That's why they're very short. Uh, they do sexually reproduce. And here is a structure that reproduces, not with flowers, but with spores, dust-like particles. Uh, and the, the spore-producing structure uh, is shown right here. It's called a capsule, and it's held by a stalk, and it's given the name of a setae. And so by being up a little bit, the spores will spread a little bit more. Uh, so here's a six-minute video that's really interesting, and it compares moss with something called lichen. And there's a Canvas quiz that goes along with it. Uh, going up into more complex, um, the phylum Terephyta are ferns. Uh, some of you may have eaten fiddleheads. If you pick them young, um, they're pretty good. They can be bitter if you get them a little bit older. But these are the unrolled fern leaves that people harvest. And um, I've had them, I think, once or twice. And then ferns have large divided leaves. So ferns have a vascular system. They have special tissue to carry water up in tubes. And so by doing that, ferns can be much larger. You can even have tree-like ferns, and there are fern relatives that were around during the times of the dinosaurs. And on the bottom of the ferns, instead of having a set down capsule like the mosses do, they have these round structures called sporangia. So these yellow brown structures on the bottom are where the spores are produced. And again, they release them as dust-like particles, which are really the fertilized eggs that will grow into new ferns. Okay, so uh, for the seedless plants, for plants that don't produce seeds, ferns are pretty advanced. And so here's one that will grow into a short tree. All right, so finally we get to seed plants. And so conifers are, are something we're all familiar with. Uh, there are other kinds of gymnosperms as well. Okay, conifers are naked seed plants or gymnosperms, and there are about 600 species of conifers. Uh, in most of the terrestrial environments on Earth, it's the flowering plants that dominate the environment. But in northern environments, so places like Alaska and northern Canada, and as you get towards Scandinavia and the Arctic Circle, these uh, needle-like trees with cones are what dominate the landscape. Okay, there are a lot of tall trees, needle-like leaves. Uh, they're good at coping with dryness. They're good at coping with um, cold temperature. Uh, we're familiar with pine trees, spruces, firs, cedars, sequoias. Okay, so why are they called naked seeds? They have seeds, but the seeds are not enclosed by the fruit. And so here are the scales on the pine cone, and here are the seeds underneath. And when the scales lift up, when the pine cone matures, the seeds just fall out. Uh, we tend to see the pine cones, and we think, oh, that's what the only reproductive structure is on pine trees. But there are also male cones. The male cones tend to be smaller, and they tend to be nondescript. You don't notice them really and they produce the pollen, the male part, and the female have the eggs in the female part. And here this shows underneath, here's the ovule where the egg develops, and the uh, pollen is gonna grow through a pollen tube uh, down and fertilize the egg within the ovule, and then the seeds will develop. Now uh, here are a few kinds of conifers. So here's a spruce tree, here's a sequoia looking from below, uh, here's a juniper tree, and once in a while there are deciduous um, conifers, conifers that will drop their leaves. So this is something called a, a tamarack, and its leaves have turned yellow and will fall off. That's unusual on conifers, but not unheard of. Okay, uh, after the flowering plants, conifers are the most important group of plants. You wouldn't be surprised by that. 
because we use a tremendous amount of wood. Uh, we use it not just for building and furniture, but also for things like uh, toilet paper, which is made out of sawdust. So uh, paper for writing, books, uh, things like turpentine. So there are a lot of economic products to have on a forest and having conifers. Uh, here's a great story, and I'm going to ask you some questions about this video on the Willamie Pines. Uh, they only exist in a canyon on Australia. And the story goes that uh, somebody was out walking the woods, he was a fish and game person, and somehow he saw these pines, and somehow he got close enough that he took a branch back to a botanist, and the botanist looked at it and he said, yeah, I, I know this plant, but only from the fossil record. They were supposed to have died out, out thousands and thousands of years ago. And so he found this community of a hundred of these plants. And so they reproduce by cones, just like uh, other conifers. And here's a cone developing. I can't tell you whether it's a male cone or a female cone. And here's a famous sequoia called the General Sherman tree in Sequoia National Park. And so you can go there sometime and see it. All right, uh, the flowering plants. So most of this semester will be focused on the flowering plants. Sometimes we'll call them angiosperms, but the phylum name is actually Anthophyta. And uh, they're the only plants that have flowers and true fruits, and the seeds are inside of that fruit. Uh, they're the most widespread vegetation on Earth. They dominate most terrestrial ecosystems. They're incredibly diverse. So we've said earlier there were 300,000 plants, 300,000 species, and 260,000 of these species are flowering plants. They're most the most important economically. So we've been talking about rice and uh, soybeans and so on. Those are all flowering plants. And uh, they ro arose most recently of the different phylum about uh, 200 million years ago, according to um, the Concepts of Biology book. I usually give the figure 100 million, but uh, they're always finding new fossils and going back into origins. All right, uh, here's an image of a flower and how it works. And we'll go into more details later, but for now, uh, most flowers, not all, have both male and female parts. The male far part produces the pollen, and inside the pollen grain is the sperm. Okay, here's the female part, and at the bottom of the female part is the ovary, which contains multiple ovules or eggs. And when the ovary enlarges and ripens, it will be the fruit containing the seeds. Okay, so here's a seed. Seeds contain the embryo that will grow into the baby plant. It's mostly stored starch, and it's surrounded by a hard seed coat. So we say that seeds are dormant, and they're sleeping, and then when you give them water and nutrients, uh, they start growing again and um, have all the properties of life once they start growing. Um, this is showing some flowering plants. The two plants on the left are monaceous. That means within a plant you have both male and female parts. The plant on the top uh, has both male and female structures within a single flower. The plant on the bottom has separate flowers within the same plant. Okay, so that's what we see with squash plants. Plants have both male and female flowers, but they're separate flowers, okay? Diaceous means separate plants are male and female. So this particular plant, here's a plant that's only male, and here's a plant that's only female. So monaceous means one sex. There's one plant that has both male and female, and diaceous means two sexes. There's separate plants that are boys and girls. So here's just a variety of flowering plants. This is called the southern spice bush. It's in the same plant family as cinnamon. Uh, here's pepper plants. Pepper was responsible for a lot of the world trade at one time. Uh, here is a lotus flower, and they're grown on, in water for their beauty. 
And uh, here is a magnolia tree. And so here's the fruit and the seeds have a red waxy coat. So it's ripening and the seeds are about to spill out of the fruit. Uh, most flowering plants are divided into two groups, monocots and dicots. So when flowering plants first emerge, they almost immediately split into uh, monocots and your book calls them eudicots, true dicots. And so um, as we go through the course and the anatomy, we'll say this is what a monocot looks like in terms of its anatomy. This is what a dicot looks like or a eudicot looks like in terms of it, its anatomy. Okay, here um, a rice plant and a tiger lily are both uh, monocots. And over here, here are some bean seeds and a, a daisy plant, and they're both eudicots. All right, so just a summary on some things about angiosperms from the OpenStax textbook, Concepts of Biology. Uh, they're the dominant form of life in uh, terrestrial ecosystems about 90% of all plants. Um, most crop plants, most ornamental plants, most plants you'll see in your daily life other than trees are gonna be angiosperms or anthophyta. Uh, their success results from two innovative structures, the flower and the fruit. Okay, we'll go through the flowers in lab and we'll talk about fruits in lab as well.